All right, well, let's start off with a word of prayer. I invite you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. It's a gorgeous day outside. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us this week. So many blessings, Lord, and we're thankful for your love and for your graciousness towards us, for your patience. We thank you, Jesus, for the power of your Holy Spirit in us, who is working out your character in us, Jesus, and who is giving us the direction and the guidance that we need to live in this world. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control of this world. Um, nothing has, catches you off guard. And we know that we can implicitly trust in your power and in your guidance. Lord, we pray that you will bless us this morning as we open your word and we discuss this, uh, this particular message. I pray, Lord, that what I speak and what I think this morning will reflect your word, the truth of your word. I pray, Lord, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon all of us here in the church and in the different homes that are watching right now, Lord. Um, for each guest and for each member that is watching, I pray that you will speak to their hearts and speak to my heart as well, Lord. I'm no different. I need you. In fact, I need your spirit more because I'm the one that's here sharing and teaching. And I'm most susceptible to errors or mistakes or just sharing personal opinions. Help me, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will guide me and that my lips will reflect what you uh, desire for us to hear this morning. And Lord, there are uh, people all over the world and here locally in Tempe and Mesa and Phoenix and Chandler um, that have all been affected, but some more than others. Some people that are listening to me right now are really experiencing stressful times right now. And I want to pray, Lord, that you will help us to be helpful hands and encouraging lips to them. But I pray most of all that you, O Holy Spirit, will bring comfort and hope and stability and, um, and balanced thoughts and just strength, just inner strength to face these days and to have confidence that you are and you have are and are meeting our needs and will continue to do so. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for your blessing now as we open your word and we thank you for being here with us. We thank you for all the angels that are here present in, in this church. So bless us now, Lord, for we ask these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The other thing I want, to, um, I want to mention, I thought about this the other day, and um, so what I like to offer you is everything that I say here, I want to introduce a question and answer session. So the things that you heard uh, me say last week, the things that you're going to hear this morning and next week, and then, of course, the coming week, I want to introduce a Q&A session. And the way that's going to work is I want you to text your questions to my phone, and I'll give that to you. Most of you have my phone number, but I'll give that to you next week. I'll post it on the screen. And I want you to text in your questions that you have. And a certain portion of the worship service will simply be a question and, and answer session, probably between five and, and seven minutes. So I want to introduce that next week. So pay attention to everything that's going on, what I'm about to say, and then you can ask some questions on what I said or offer some comments um, so that we can do that for next week. So that's the new um, element of our worship that I want to do um, for you since that we're not here uh, uh, you know, face to face. Um, I'd like to hear from you on, um, on your input on uh, what is being said for this morning. All right, so I want to give a, a recap from last week. Um, last week, uh, so again, we're doing a three-part series called um, These Empty Pews Are Full. Last week's sermon was entitled Christ in Crisis. This morning it is entitled, and it's on the screen, COVID-19 and Apocalypse, um, this morning's message. But just a quick recap from last week. Um, what I said was that Christ knows crisis personally. He experienced circumstances that were very stressful in his life. And um, a couple of lessons that we gleaned from that last week was that Jesus is seasoned in troubles. 
He knows troubles like nobody else does. Then the second lesson we looked at was that Jesus is savior of troubles. He's not only seasoned in troubles, but he's the savior of troubles. And what I meant by that was that when we experience times of dilemma and difficulty and disturbance, God will help us to maintain our spiritual and mental uh, composure. So even th the things that may affect us in a certain way, um, in fact, we've even had uh, brothers and sisters, a few of them of the Adventist church have died from the coronavirus. But in spite of that, God will help us and to keep us strong. The other uh, part of that, uh, Jesus' savior of troubles, that uh, Jesus will save us from impending doom. The classical text is Psalm chapter 91, where Jesus will save us from certain plagues and pestilences, etc. As long as we have this faith and trust relationship with him, we can't be presumptuous. And then the other thing we looked at last week was that we need to be cautious of not allowing the pandemic of fear to strangle us, which can be worse than the coronavirus pandemic itself. So we need to be cautious of this pandemic of fear. And then we shared last week things to do to support yourself, um, continue our devotional time with God, take breaks from watching and reading all about this virus, um, take care of our bodies, practice the new start, nutrition, exercise, water, etc. Of course, what health officials are saying, washing our hands, etc. We also shared last week on things to support our children. Um, those that have young children at home, to take time to uh, walk our children's and teens through this whole outbreak of COVID-19, answer questions and share factual information with them. Um, and I, I really emphasize factual information because there's some conspiracy theories floating out there. So share uh, factual information with them, read the Bible and pray together. And um, there, a lot that we said last week, but the other thing I want to say is as far as supporting our children, we covered this last week, is that our children will look at us adults, us parents, as their role models. Of course, obviously, the, the younger, the very young ones. Um, and so they're going to take your lead. So if, you, if our children, small children in our homes, see us uh, worried and, and panicking and, and just, uh, you know, we're, we're becoming unraveled because of this coronavirus, the children are going to likewise, more likely than not, going to follow that attitude. And so be careful. Pray together and, there's, and uh, eat right and, and take a break with your children and go outside and you know, look at flowers or, or something. So that's what we looked at last week. That's a, a quick recap from last week. Okay, this morning, entitled COVID-19 and Apocalypse. Um, I want to share with you on the screen, I want to direct your eyes to the screen on what some uh, people have been saying on the internet. Um, this one is coming from March 4. Don't know how serious the coronavirus is going to be in truth. And this was instead March 4. But there was some passage in the book of Revelation from the Bible where it talks about a significant portion of humanity being wiped out by disease and pestilence. Another person says, doesn't the book of Revelation mention the lamb smoting the anti-pope with coronavirus? I've never heard that one before. I heard of an anti-Christ, um, but I don't, I'm not sure about a lamb smoting an anti-pope. In other words, that's somebody against the pope. Um, and this next one here, uh, the impulsive Texan on February 27 wrote, um, Australian wildfires, fires, coronavirus, earthquakes in odd places, increased rage murders worldwide, massive hunger increases, and there are those that laugh at the book of Revelation. So there's, there's things that are being said, um, whether this is the end of the world or signs of the end of the world, um, etc. So we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to go into a bit. Uh, some passages in the, the Bible, and then uh, take a deeper look. According to Christian, uh, I'll, I won't name him, uh, it's a Christian evangelist, not from my particular church. He says that the coronavirus is one of 10 plagues currently haunting the earth, and he names them. Unprecedented flooding, weather patterns, weather patterns, unusual volcanic eruptions, of course, the coronavirus uh, the African swine fever, the swine flu, etc. He names 10 in all together. And the Washington Post uh, said this just um, a couple of weeks ago on March 17. James Beverly, a professor at Tyndale Seminary in Toronto, said he found in researching his forthcoming book um, on Trump, Donald Trump, and Christian prophecy that charismatic and Pentecostal prophets who normally think the end times are near have been, le have been less likely to forecast doom 
during the Trump administration. So I want to uh, invite you to focus on what's written here on the screen. And this is what he says. Some are saying that Satan is the source of, source of evils like the virus, but the doom and gloom message is missing. There is such a positive view on Trump and such strong wishes for his re-election that there is deep hope that the virus will die out, a strong economy will return, and Trump will defeat the Democratic nominee, Beverly wrote in an email. It is stunning how optimistic charismatic prophets are since Trump won in 2016. So it's interesting how some uh, charismatics and Pentecostals out there are connecting this coronavirus and relating it somehow in a political fashion with our current president. Um, if you again look on the screen, and I'm going to invite Robert just to stick to the screen right now, so ignore me for a moment. Um, I found this very interesting. This, uh, this actually comes from the Pew Research Center, which is a very reputable uh, company. And it says here that um, all of U.S. adults, 43% believe that the coronavirus came naturally while 23% say that it developed intentionally in a lab. Intentionally. Now that's, that's the conspiracy theory that I was referring to earlier. And then of course it gives the um, Republican or leaning Republicans and Democrats, those who lean towards Democrats, it gives their view of it, how 37% Republicans believe it came about naturally, while 52%, a higher percentage, believe it came out naturally. And the Republicans, 30% believe it developed intentionally, while only 16% of the Democrats believe that it uh, developed intentionally. And so it's interesting how uh, pandemics uh, are somehow being um, it connected with who happens to be at the White, off, uh, the, the, the White House and how Republicans and Democrats are viewing this a little bit different. Now, some of you have read this. Um, I don't follow tweets. I don't follow everything that's happening. But um, Kim Kardashian, I hope I'm, I think I, that's the way you say her last name, Kim Kardashian, um, I found out that tweeted something and that it just went like wildfire all over the place. And this is what she tweeted. There's this book by Sylvia Brown, and I have here, it was published, there was actually uh, another book published later, but this one was published in 2008, and her book says, end of days, let me see here. Uh, yes, Sylvia Brown, end of days, predictions and prophecies about the end of the world. If you can't see it clearly on the screen, that's what the title says. And this is what she said back in 2008. In around 2020, a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe, attacking the lungs and the bronchial tubes and resisting all known treatments. Almost more baffling than the illness itself will be the fact that it will suddenly vanish and as quickly as it arrived, attack again 10 years later, which would be in 2030, and then disappear um, completely. And uh, this just went, again, it went viral. People are, are in fact, um, somebody texted me last week regarding the statement, and that's why I, I did some research and I, I found the statement. Um, and um, she, this particular woman, I'm, I'm going to, I'll share this later if I remember correctly, but I have a whole page of some of her f predictions that became false. And in fact, just like Nostradamus, um, this prediction, supposed prediction back in 2008, actually has some uh, vagueness in it as far as um, it's pneumonia-like. Well, we know that the coronavirus attacks the, the lungs, it gives you a fever, but it's not necessarily pneumonia-like. The, the major symptoms are a cough and fever, uh, but not pneumonia-like. That's just a little bit of clue, but I might share with some of her predictions that actually proved false um, so that some of our viewers will realize that the only one that can predict 100% with 100% accuracy is the Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to be careful not to go and, you know, on a tangent with some of these predictions that people are going to make. Um, predictions and psychics and mediums are predicting all the time. All right, so I know that was a long introduction. Let's go into the Bible and what the Bible says. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. And then um, um, I should say open to Luke 21, but keep your finger in Luke 21. 
and then go back to Matthew chapter 24. And then we're going to look at Revelation chapter 16 for this morning's message called COVID-19 and the Apocalypse, or End Apocalypse. So I want to start out with Matthew 24. Again, you're, we're going to go to Luke chapter 21, and then we'll go to Revelation chapter 16. All right, Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8 is what um, I'm going to read. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And the Bible says this, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not, what? Frightened. See that you are not frightened, the Bible says, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. This is what Jesus said. So let's pay attention, uh, very close attention to what he said. He said the same thing in Luke chapter 21 um, and verse 11. Luke chapter 21 and verse 11. Luke 21 and verse 11. The Bible says, Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So this is what Jesus said. So his statements to his disciples is in regards to signs of the last days, and he was actually in both places um, he was actually applying these words of Matthew 24 and Luke 21 um, to a combination of events, to a combination of events, signs of the nearness of his coming, the destruction of Jerusalem, and of course, the end of the world. Now, back in Matthew 24, the best manuscripts don't contain the word plagues or pestilence. Um, um, King James Version, New King James Version includes those words, but a lot of the Bibles don't include that word in Matthew 24, a plague or pestilence, but that word is included in Luke chapter 21. Um, and of course, the word pestilence um, figuratively means a pest. It's something that you don't want. It's just a pest. Go away. So here's what Jesus is saying in these verses. Um, for sure, He's saying that there will be pestilences or plagues in various places. That's what Jesus said, and we can bank on that. Um, now, whether this means a worldwide pandemic, in other words, I think right now it's affected 190 countries. Whether what Jesus meant is that it's going to be a worldwide pandemic happening, or there will be a pestilence over here, and a different pestilence over here, and a different one over here, he doesn't really say. He just says that there will be pestilences and plagues. Now, this particular plague or pestilence, COVID-19, is one plague, it's one pestilence, and it's worldwide. But we need to be careful not to read into the Bible what's not there. We just don't know if Jesus meant one particular plague all over the world, or there will be plagues, and there will be happening in different places. Um, so, that's exactly what he's saying. Um, what is interesting is that he does say in Luke chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, just a few verses earlier, he says this, And he said, See to it that you are not misled, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end does not follow immediately. He says the same thing in Matthew 24, but all these things are the beginning of birth pangs. So what is very clear is that whatever plagues and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes may occur, Jesus states that these things are not signs that the end is here. In other words, the end of time, that we're just, we're out of time. The clock has struck 12. There's no sand left in the upper part of the hourglass. Um, he is um, not saying that these signs are that the end is here, but that the end is still to come is what he's saying. 
In other words, that these things are signs of the beginning of the time of the end. That's why he says it's like a woman in birth pangs. Um, the, she's having these uh, contractions, she's having these pains, but those pains themselves do not mean that the baby is coming out at the same time she's having that, uh, she's in labor. The birth, those are the beginning of birth pangs. The actual birth, the actual culmination of those pangs come a little bit later uh, as, as far as a woman's pregnancy is concerned. Um, but that the end is still to come. These things are the signs of the beginning of the time of the end. What we don't know, what we don't know is the length of time between these signs of the beginning of birth pangs and when the actual end will be. We just don't know that. Jesus said himself, no man knows the day or the hour um, when he will come back. So all of the signs and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes, etc., these are things that are happening in the political world, in the natural world, in the viral world, in the, on the molecular level. All of these things are signs that we are nearing the end, but it's not the end yet, but that we are close <clears throat> we are close to it. Now, signs are designed to alert us to something, right? That's what signs are for. Whether it's a speed traffic sign or whether it's a stop sign or whether it's wrong way sign or yield sign, all signs are designed to alert us to something. So likewise, the signs that Jesus is referring to are designed to alert us to the nearness of the end, but they are not signals of the end itself. And in fact, <clears throat> in Matthew 24, verse 13 uh, or 14, Jesus says this, and the gospel will be preached throughout, the all, throughout all of the world, and then the end will come. So if you want to choose and pick a particular sign that is the sign that is alerting us to the fact that, wow, the end is right here, it is the spreading of the gospel in the whole world. Now, if you think about that, that's very important. Because people will say, and rightly so, we've always had earthquakes. We've always had plagues and famines. We've always had sicknesses. Ever since the beginning of time, we've always had those. Now, true, they may be increasing in measure and in degree in the in last days, but we've always had those things. <clears throat> um, but the sign that uh, foretells that the end is really right at the door is the spreading of the gospel. And let me just spend a, a minute or two talking about this because I think it's very important. I don't want to bypass this very important lesson in this. Many people, many of us as human beings, we like to hear predictions and we're fascinated and allured to predictions that are made and things that are going to happen. And of course, Hollywood has gotten on this bandwagon, bandwagon since years ago and making movies about the end times and... Uh, you know, and, and doom and gloom movies and disaster and catastrophe impending, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this, is, this is just something that whets our appetite and it, it, it attracts us. We like those things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but the most important thing from Jesus' perspective is to spread the gospel, is to spread the gospel. In the book of Revelation, there are these three angels in the last days that are flying throughout the entire planet, having the everlasting gospel to preach and preaching about we should worship and honor, uh, uh, give God glory and honor and worship him who made the heavens and the earth. There's another angel that, uh, that is a warning message to those who are, um, who are close to worshiping the, the beast and receiving his mark. There's another message that says, you know, if you do have the mark of the beast and worship his image, this is what's going to happen. These are uh, messages of warning. It starts with the gospel. You cannot give a warning to somebody without first presenting Jesus Christ and what he is about and what can, he can do with our lives. So even in the days where there are pestilences and famines and earthquakes and plagues, it is important not to lose our focus as believers in Christ. We continue to spread the gospel because that is what is going to usher in the end of time. And it just makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense. Jesus wants everybody to hear him as much as possible. Not everybody will have that opportunity, but Jesus wants us to preach 
the gospel and not to hunker down and become hermits and hoard and be afraid to go out, although we have to take cautionary, precautionary measures, but we still need to be preaching the gospel. This is so important. Now, um, what I talked about earlier, um, these are only the beginning of birth pangs and it's not the end itself. That may sound like a technicality or just splitting hairs, but it does make a big difference because too many people may be crying that the end is now here because of the coronavirus when that is not what Jesus meant in Matthew or Luke. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 16 because this is where uh, the Bible talks about plagues, the seven last plagues. Revelation chapter 16, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter because the whole chapter uh, deals with these plagues. Revelation chapter 16, the first plague is in verse 2. So just, if you have your Bible open, just put your eyes on verse 2. I'm not going to read it, but the first plague is about loathsome sores on people who have the mark of the beast. These are, you know, boils, sores all over the body. It's just a horrible thing. Um, but it only comes upon those who have the mark of the beast, which is a cue it, that should cue us into the fact that chronologically, the mark of the beast must come first. And then the people who have the mark of the beast and are worshiping its image receive these sores as a result of following the beast. Now, I believe that that mark of the beast has not happened yet. Therefore, we don't see people uh, plagued with sores. Um, that's the first plague. The second plague is that the sea turns to blood. That is in verse 3. The third plague is in verses 4 through 7. The rivers and the waters, in other words, our water sources, uh, turn into blood. And um, verses 8 through 9, the fourth plague is that the sun's heat scorches people. I just, that's horrible. I don't know how that's going to pan out. It just sounds horrible where the sun is so hot. I live, we live here in Arizona. And, uh, you know, the Tempe Church is right here in the valley. And I sometimes think, what would it feel like if it were to reach 140 degrees? I mean, that is, I just can't fathom how hot that can be. Um, the electrical grid will shut down. Air conditioning, air conditioners will shut down. Uh, what do you do to keep cool? Um, I, I don't know how that's going to look, but that's the fourth plague. The fifth plague is found in verses 10 and 11, where the beast's kingdom becomes intensely dark and they gnaw their tongues and teeth because of the intense, the intensity of the darkness of the beast's kingdom. Now, um, I don't believe that it is a literal darkness that you can touch. I think it's a darkness of mind, a darkness of spirit. And there's just absolutely, absolute, pure hopelessness. And you're just, you're in the dark. Uh, that's what I feel that that's referring to because of all the symbolism here. The sixth plague is in verses 12 through 16. And the sixth one is where the water of the river Euphrates is dried up to prepare kings from the east. Uh, to prepare for this battle of Armageddon. And then the seventh and last plague, a great earthquake comes, splits the great city into three, which the great city is Babylon, and the cities of the nations fall, islands disappear, and huge hailstones, about 100 pounds, fall from the sky. Now, if you were to think of a hailstone, 100 pounds, I would say that's maybe, I mean, ice is heavy. So if it's so dense, I don't know, maybe it's about that big, a uh, hundred pound hailstone. You can just imagine the destruction that this is going to cause on structures and on, on vegetation and on people and animals. It, that's going to be horrible. That is the seventh and last plague. Now, a very crucial point to remember is that in Revelation, we find, well, the book itself is an apocalyptic book. Um, it is apocalyptic prophecy, meaning that it uses symbolism and metaphors and imagery at a very, very high level, like Daniel does in, uh, in the Old Testament. So you cannot interpret everything in Revelation in literal terms. And there's a lot of examples for this. For example, the locusts of chapter 9. These locusts have um, hair like women and uh, breastplates of iron and, and faces like men. Um, you, can't in, you can't interpret that literally. 
Um, there's a conglomerate beast in chapter 13 of a leopard, a bear, and a lion having seven heads. That is not literal interpreting that should be happening there. Um, in chapter 5, you have a literal lion standing in heaven uh, that is the tribe of Judah. When John is seeing this vision in heaven, um, this is symbolic language. There's not a literal big lion up there. Plus, right after that, he talks about a slain lamb before the throne. He, this is all symbolic language that represents Jesus Christ. But other than this, not one of these plagues, even if couched in symbolic terms, mentions a pestilence in the form of a sickness or disease. Not one of those plagues. With the exception of the first one that mentions boils and sores on people, that is a far cry from what we're experiencing now, the COVID-19. That's not what COVID-19 uh, does. The only one that would come close is that one, um, these malignant sores. But in addition, these sores only plague those who have the mark of the beast and who worship its image. And because if you connect Revelation chapter 13 with Revelation 16 and the mark of the beast, that mark of the beast has not happened yet. So we need to be careful and not just run away with some of these statements, rip them out of context and say, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. We need to be careful from doing that. What the coronavirus does teach us is that everyone is vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. Now, it's true that some may be more vulnerable than others, according to the age group and according to how strong our immune systems are. But it is, it is, um, it's indiscriminate. It, it, it can attack anybody. Um, the younger, those of you who are younger age may feel you're immune. Um, that's just not true because younger people are having, are getting this virus as well. Again, they may not be in as much as danger as the elderly, but nevertheless, um, what the virus teaches us is that it is indiscriminate on race or age. We are all vulnerable, vulnerable to this. So I am presenting to you this morning that this is not um, a fulfillment of a plague and revelation. Jesus does say that there will be pestilences and famines. Um, and that has always happened. In fact, I want to share some more information in just a little bit. But whether this is an actual fulfillment of prophetic, a prophetic prediction, I would say it's hard to tell. It doesn't mean that we are to lull and take it in stride and, well, you know, uh, life goes on, this is no big deal. I'm not saying that, but I'm not saying that we should run away with this and start tweeting and texting and, you know, I'm quoting Sylvia Brown books that, hey, this is, the end is here. Um, this is what is happening today. Jesus is coming soon. The rapture is going to take place soon, as some evangelical Christians believe. Much less, much less, um, I want to be careful the way I say this. Um, we, especially here in the United States of America, especially here in America, we tend to connect, as some are doing, this event with politics. Now, even we do that at sometimes. I believe Revelation 13 predicts the combination of religious and political powers. Um, that may be true. But we just, I'm just saying we need to be cautious of because whoever is sitting at the White House, then this is not such a big deal, deal, it'll pass away. To me, that is depending too much on human flesh, on a, hu on a human being. No, we are to depend on the Lord. We are to bring, uh, uh, take our confidence and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in whoever happens to be the President of the United States. We need to be careful with that. Um, the other thing I want to say is crisis has a way of bringing to the surface deep-seated philosophies and worldviews and our true selves. Um, when things like this happen, we can be surprised how some people are reacting. We look at, we've seen videos, all of you have seen videos when, um, oh, what's that called? Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. All of us have been shocked when we see those videos of people fighting over that 65 inch television uh, inch uh, television you know i mean just punching each other and people you know stampeding over each other because of a product this consumerism is crazy it's just absolutely crazy 
Um, and likewise, when there's a crisis like this, um, and it gets worse, according to the Bible, and I just read some of these plagues, it's going to get worse. Crisis like this will bring out our ugly selves, or it'll bring out our best selves. Your ugly self will surface its ugly head, or your best self will surface its beautiful head in times like this. And this is the interesting thing. Now, while we are still uh, relatively safe, there's a virus out there, but it's going to get worse according to the Bible. Now is the time to be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ and have a strong, vibrant, healthy relationship with Jesus so that when it does get worse, we're not going to fall apart and become unraveled at all of our, our psychological and emotional seams. We will be intact because we know in whom we have served. We know in whom we have believed. Very, very important. Crisis has a way of bringing to the surface um, our ideas and philosophies and worldviews, even though some of those things may have been hidden from others for years. There are some people that are harboring and nurturing and cultivating certain ideas about the world and politics and the church and other brothers and sisters in the church that are hidden from you and me. We don't know what people are thinking until things start happening and things start sifting and the rug feels like it's being pulled out from under our feet. Then these thoughts and these ways of thinking and philosophies are going to surface. And that's what crisis does. It reveals the dross that we have in our characters and it will reveal in others, it will reveal the solid gold that are in our characters. I always tell my family, desperate people do desperate things in desperate situations. Um, that is a truth that we're going to be seeing more and more. Disease and pestilences are a sad reminder of the broken and fallen state of our world. I think we all know that. So while we need to do all to prevent and combat the spread of COVID-19, we need to be praying for God's mercy on our little planet, and we need to be praying for us to be compassionate. But we also need to keep perspectives. Let me share a, a few statistics with you. Um, more people die from AIDS and HIV than have died in this coronavirus. Here's some stats. When it first appeared in 1981, 32 million people have died from HIV. 32 million. 74.9 million have become infected. That's 75 million people that have become infected with the, uh, with the HIV virus since 1981, since 1981, not just in one year, since 1981. Um, let me give you some more stats. Um, and again, I'm not making a political statement, but I will tell you right now, uh, I believe that life is precious in God's eyes, whether it's life outside the womb or life inside the womb. Approximately, here in the United States, I'm just giving stats from the United States, approximately in 2017 alone, 862,320 abortions were performed. Almost a million abortions in 2017. One million deaths. Now, that was down 7% from 2014. So abortions, and then of course nowadays you know that many states are now becoming more and more anti-abortion uh, today. Um, the abortion rate in 2017 was down 8% from 2014, so that is the lowest rate ever observed in the United States. In 1973, the year abortion became legal, the rate was 16.3, 16 16.3%. Uh, Here's another one. The Spanish flu, uh, many of you know about the Spanish flu, um, not personally, but have heard about it um, in 1918. From 1918 through 1920, the Spanish flu, the influenza virus that just decimated the entire world. It killed an estimated between 50 and 100 million people. Between 50 and 100 million people in, in the entire world. It killed about 675,000 people in the United States alone. Uh, this flu pandemic uh, from 1918 to 1920. It infected an estimated one-third of the world population, and at that time the population in those years was about 1.8 billion. And so if 75, I just took figures, these figures say between 50 and 100 million people died uh, from the Spanish flu. 
Well, I took the figure 75 million just in between. If 75 million people died, that would be 4.16% of the world population from 1918 to 1920. That is a lot of people. So I hate to make, I'm not saying we need to compare and by making these comparisons, oh, then the coronavirus is, is nothing. It's just, you know, it's just a, a drop in the bucket. It's just a penny from a thousand dollars. Um, so I don't want you to give the impression, I may be giving that impression that in comparison, this is nothing. Because those who have the virus, those who have had lost, who have lost family, they could care less about these statistics. My mom died, my, my, my grandpa died. So I don't want to be insensitive. All I'm saying is that for us to be cautious that the coronavirus is the sign, this is the worst thing that has happened, this is the end of the world, um, we, need to, we need to have perspective, we need to be careful, be cautious and respect the virus and wash our hands and, and be compassionate and help those who need help. Yes, those things, but we need to have perspective. Here's one more. We need to be better stewards of our world and of God's creatures and of our health. And of our health. Um, there's a lot of viruses that stem from, that are zootic in nature. What that means is um, viruses, bacteria, germs that can transfer from an animal to human being zootic. Um, the swine flu, the H1N1, uh, Ebola, MERS, SARS. MERS is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. SARS is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome that uh, originated in Asia, MERS in, in the Middle East. Um, anthrax, COVID-19, these are all zootic diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. Um, and I want to say this, it's not 100% sure as far as the COVID-19. I've read, as I said this week when we were doing the welcome, I think I mentioned this, um, I got to read a lot of stuff on, on all of this. Um, but as far as the COVID-19 is concerned, um, some researchers and authorities saying that it probably originated from pangolins. The pangolin is a it's a very cute animal. It's probably about this big and it's very scaly. Some of the scales are about that big, according to which part of the body, but it's all covered with scales um, that are the same material as our fingernails. What's that material called, our fingernails? Um, can't remember what that's called, but it's, it's a fingernail-like type material. The, this is the most uh, trafficked mammal in the entire globe. I've seen pictures of these poor animals just being... Uh, slaughtered in these uh, these what they call wet markets in Asia and in China, um, where Wuhan, uh, the wet market in Wuhan, where the coronavirus originated, um, and then civet cats uh, and and bats and um, you know the the MERS came from dromedary camels, those camels that have one hump. These viruses and germs um, can transmit from an animal to a human. The swine flu is not necessarily transmitted by consuming pork, but in all of the handling and it's in the slaughtering, etc., that uh, the swine flu can be transferred to a human being. As far as I know, as far as what I've read, I think only two dogs in the entire world have been uh, diagnosed with, with the uh, COVID-19. But here's, here's the point that I want to make. First of all, we should be promoting healthy eating. We should be promoting healthy eating. Um, second of all, we should be respecting the Lord's animals that he created on planet Earth. Um, all of this trafficking of the pangolins is because the scales are believed to have medicinal properties in them and that the meat itself is, uh, 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 contributes to male virility and, and things like this and is the most trafficked mammal in the world, as I mentioned. Bats, some of you have seen the videos where in these wet markets, they just have these dead bats and they're slaughtering them left and right for, con for human consumption. The Bible says that there are certain animals that should be consumed and certain animals that should not be consumed. This is in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. The best diet is a vegetarian one. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not say, if you want to become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you must be vegetarian. We don't teach that. 
um, we're sensitive that worldwide there are people that have access to a healthy vegetarian diet and there are people that don't. We promote that as the best diet that was the original for human beings, but we come short of saying, this is a Bible doctrine, you must do this. No, so that's not what I'm saying. But that is the most healthiest diet. And as far as God's creatures are concerned, let's stop slaughtering them for human gain and human consumption and, for, and just to line people's pockets so they become richer for those who are marketing these poor animals. We need to stop doing this and become better stewards of our planet Earth and of God's creatures in particular and of our own bodies and eating right and living healthy lifestyles. Now, uh, I'm not saying that those who have a particular healthy diet are going to completely be immune from the virus. I am not saying that. What I am saying is by living healthy lifestyles, our nutrition intake and our exercising and our water intake and, and, and just our lifestyles and trust in God and living temperate lives, your and my immune systems are going to be heavily boosted up. Those numbers are going to rise and will be less susceptible not only to COVID-19, but all of these other sicknesses in the world today, simply because we are being better stewards of our lives, better stewards of God's creation, and better stewards of the animals that God has given us to enjoy. Um, I want to share uh, uh, one more uh, stat here on the screen, if you want to go to the screen. This is concerning the Asian countries like, uh, uh, like Taiwan and Vietnam and took very, very quick and decided actions in early January when this stuff broke out in November. Very, very quick actions. They have stopped it or they have extremely slowed it down because of the uh, measures that they took that we're not taking here, unfortunately, in the United States, some of the same measures that they took. But if you look at this chart, this comes from the Worldometer. If you go on whatever it is, World, Worldometer, uh, Worldometer, Worldometer.org or I think .com, it'll give you live feeds of how many people have been infected, the latest cases, the latest deaths, etc., and it'll break it down country by country, etc. Now, I drew these circles on the screen. You notice the United States the United States is now the epicenter for total cases. America, we are the number one in the entire world as far as cases are concerned. We have surpassed China, uh, you know, 20,000 cases ago, if you look at this. Uh, excuse me, Italy. Um, but if you look at total deaths, Italy is the epicenter for the COVID-19. Um, Italy has 9,134 total deaths. And I should have done the percentages of, you know, of total cases uh, and the 9,000 died. What's the percentage of the 86,000? As far as total cases per million in population, Spain is the number one country. So Spain, um, out of every million people, there are 1,545 cases of COVID-19. In the United States, there's 317 cases per million people. And in Italy, there are 1,431 cases per million people. So Italy is a close second to Spain. Um, and as far as deaths per million, um, the United States has five deaths per million. Italy has 151. Spain has 122. China, too. And so if you look at these stats, the United States is lower. But as far as, now you have to look at population as well, but China is what, one point something billion people, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, but look at the number of uh, cases and deaths in China compared to their population. So if we were to look at the per capita, um, the United States is just, we're, it's very, very unfortunate what is happening here in the United States. So um, to wrap up, and we're going to go to that vote momentarily, to wrap up, COVID-19, if I could summarize what, uh, what I talked about this morning, the COVID-19 virus, it's a, it's a plague, it's a pestilence. I don't think none of us will have any problem terming it that way. But we need to be careful and to start proclaiming that this is the end of the world, or this is a sure, uh, a telltale sign that, that the end of the world is happening. We've, all of these things that I've mentioned uh, earlier, 
the influenza of, two, uh, excuse me, of 1918 through 1920, uh, that was a little over 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago. It'd be interesting to see the newspapers and the religious leaders and the churches to see what they were saying back then, 1918 to 1920. This is the end of the world. Um, but there are things that um, are happening in our world all over. I think what this virus is teaching us is that, as I, again, we need to live better lives. We need to be better stewards. Um, we need to be careful how we treat our world and our planet, and, and particularly uh, the animals that God is, has given us. We need to continue to be compassionate towards those who are suffering this. We need to be cautious. We need to use a hand sanitizer and wash our hands and not just to flippantly dismiss all of this stuff. We need to be careful of, uh, of uh, getting on that bandwagon of the conspiracy theory. There are some theories out there saying that, in fact, you saw the chart that I shared earlier, that uh, depending on what party, political party, here in the United States you identify with, um, whether it's Republican or Democratic, you're going to believe that this was done intentionally in China, that this is sort of bio, a biomedical warfare. Um, I would just say be cautious with some of these theories, theories that are floating out there. Keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on your family, on your health. Keep your focus on Scripture. Continue to trust in God. Continue to trust in that He is controlling this world. He's not a controlling God, but He is the one that knows our destinies, the one that is um, operating, the one that knows about the affairs of men. He is directing our world. God is not powerless. And this is another issue that I want to talk about next week because some questions will, people will ask. In fact, again, I invite you to text me your questions for next week. We'll have a question and answer session. But um, um, some people may be asking the question, well, if God is all-loving and all-powerful, then why all of these things? You just shared, Pastor Ray, all of these abortion statistics and pandemic statistics and flu statistics and all the people that are dying. Where is God when all of this is happening? I'm going to share with you next week in that sermon and talk about that a little more. But again, I invite you to um, uh, text me any questions that you may have, and I'm going to give you the number now. It's 480 Seven three five one eight six seven four eight zero seven three five one eight six seven. Text me questions or comments, and I'll address those next week. God bless you. Let's keep our focus on the fact that God is trustworthy. He has not lost control of this planet. It is not spinning out of control. Mankind and their a, a man's heart may sometimes spin out of control for fear of the things that are about to come. But we as believers in Jesus Christ, we know that we are safe in the Lord's hands. And even if a pestilence may come, and even if I get the COVID virus, um, it's not a reason for me to, to not deny God or deny all, deny all the things that I'm saying here. I don't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. But I encourage you to be uh, uh, trusting and faithful to your Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for our lives that you've given to us. We thank you, God, for the principles in Scripture that you have given to us to live healthy and happy lives and wholesome lives and experiencing, experience wholesome and strong relationships. So we thank you for Scriptures that will never, ever disappear. We know, Lord, that we can trust in your word implicitly. Lord, our prayer goes out to those who have been infected by this virus. We are sad to hear this. We pray, Lord, that you will bring healing to those who have been diagnosed with, this, with, uh, with the virus. We know and understand that some people will die from it. So we want to ask you, Lord, for your comforting presence on those who have died, on the families who have those who have died. Lord, sometimes we our faith in you may falter. And there are some people that may be disgusted with all of this in connection with whether you really are in control of this world or not. I understand that people have these deep, uh, heartfelt questions, that there's some confusion. Lord, please 
Keep us strong in our beliefs. We know in whom we believe. Help us to be compassionate towards those. Minister to those people, Lord. Help us to be safe and practice these uh, measures that health officials are telling us to. And Lord, help us to live temperate and wholesome lives, to be careful and to reevaluate the way we are living our lives, not only physically with what we put in our stomachs, but also spiritually, Lord, the time that we spend with you, how much we are praying, how much time we are spending with you. Help us, Lord, to take assessment of these things. And that's what some of these signs do. They force us to take a reevaluation of ourselves and assessment. And that's one of these things that perhaps is a positive fallout. Although we're sad about the deaths and the cases, Lord, we pray that we will wake up to our, um, our, how we are with you, our relationship with you. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers. Continue to minister to us and keep us safe. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.